This is Austin Real Estate Investing. Austin Real Estate Investing. We'll be discussing real estate investing in Austin, Texas, and bringing you experts from all different sectors of the real estate game. Your host, Jordan Moorhead, is a real estate agent and investor in Austin and is here to help you get started or to build your portfolio and explore new strategies. Hi, this is Jordan Moorhead, and this is the Austin Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, we have Nico Salazar on, and he's going to tell us all about his experience wholesaling, buying rentals, and how he got started and has leveraged it into more properties here in Austin. Hey, Nico, how are you? Hey, Jordan. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, so I know we, we talked a little bit before we started here, but for all of our listeners, could you tell everybody who you are and how you're involved with real estate investing in the Austin area? Sure. So I, my parents came to the States from Colombia, South America, and had me in Miami, Florida, me and my brother. And that's kind of where we grew up, went to high school there, then decided that I wanted to come to Austin. Uh, nothing to do with real estate at all. Uh, my family wasn't in real estate. No one uh, even, you know, I didn't even have that in my mind, but, uh, I just kind of ended up here cause I wanted to go to, to school here at UT Austin. And, um, so I came here for college, studied finance and supply chain. Um, and I'd say it was around sophomore year of college, which is when I wanted to, you know, I, I always wanted a side hustle and, and kind of my own running my own show. And so, I started looking into a bunch of things like e-commerce and like starting a marketing company and a bunch of other stuff. And, you know, it, it didn't really work out and, and I just didn't even enjoy any of it. Um, and then I eventually ran, tried real estate. So I saw like a post on social media of someone making a bunch of money on, on like selling a house and flipping it and remodeling it. And so I figured, you know, maybe, maybe try that and and maybe I like it. And that's exactly what happened. So I, uh, it was my second year in college. Uh, when I started going, I contacted the person who posted that, that social media post. And I met up with them at, at one of the showings for a house that they were selling to investors. And I remember I was like, probably everyone there was double, double my age. And everyone was like, kind of looking at me like, you know, what is this uh, basically teenager doing here? Like no one, you know, he's not going to buy, buy the house or anything like that. And, and I wasn't, but what I was doing is, you know, trying to understand, um, you know, what, a what a house looks like that, that needs repairs, uh, how much it costs, uh, meet other people that are, that are in the industry, uh, like other realtors, lenders, and, and, you know, basically everyone that, that shows up to those meetings. And that's kind of what got me into real estate. Um, that was, that was kind of my first, uh, step into the game. And after that, I just kept, kept going to these showings of, of investors and fixer uppers and, you know, started building my network and learned about wholesaling. And so during college or throughout college, I started doing wholesaling. So I was basically flipping contracts and not actually buying the house. I was just, uh, you know, putting my name on the contract and then assigning it to, to an investor mm -hmm. and doing all the legwork for the investors. And then I would make like a fee on, on, on assigning that contract. Mm -hmm. And so that along with like summer jobs and, and, and other side gigs that I would find here and there, I was able to build up enough money to, to buy my first deal. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, I knew I needed to pick a market that, that, you know, the purchase price was lower, um, than Austin because, you know, I didn't have enough to, to start in Austin necessarily. And so I went to San Antonio, which is about an hour and a half South of, of Austin and that's where I bought my first uh, rental. And so I did the Burr method, uh, which uh, I feel like a lot of investors, you know, either hate or, or love it. Um, it gets a lot of a lot of hate from from some investors. But, you know, if if you do it properly and, and you use data to 
you know, do your due diligence. Uh, it, it, it'll turn out just fine. And that's exactly what I did. So um, the first one, it just went really well. Basically bought it, remodeled it, and then refine it, bought it with hard money, and then remodeled it and uh, refinanced out of it into a conventional loan. Mm -hmm. And then I got okay. all my money back, basically. So you, you bought it with hard money and you refinanced in a conventional loan. Uh, how did you find the hard, you know, you're talking about your wholesaling before, but how did you find the hard money lender? Was that through a wholesaler who wholesale deal? Yeah. Yeah. So like when I was doing the wholesales, mm -hmm. I would kind of ask, uh, whenever I would assign the property to the investor, I would always ask them, you know, like, Hey, like, how are you financing this? Um, and then they would be like, oh, with a hard money lender. And then I'd be like, oh, what does that mean? Like, how does that work? Like, can you explain it to me? So I was like, mm -hmm. you know, kind of asking not only, you know, it wasn't just a financial gain, I guess, from yeah. doing the wholesaling. It was a lot of, you know, networking and and knowledge that I that I got from connecting with other investors and and learning about their business. So that's why I'm always big on, you know, like networking and, and just kind of throwing yourself out there to people that you've never met before and asking them how they how they run their business. Sure. So you bought this, you bought it with hard money, you found a contractor to rehab it. And, you know, you talked about finding the numbers. So obviously you figured out what the rehab costs were going to be. And you figured out the ARV, which is the after repair value on this property to make sure it makes sense to do a burr because the burr is to buy it, you rehab it, you re you rent it, then you refinance and repeat. But if if you don't have some of those steps right, like if you don't have the the rehab and the refinance right, no, no, and the rent too, you're, you're using a conventional loan, so they don't look at the rents as much. When did you do this first burr? So the first burr was in 2019. Okay, 2019, you did the first Burr um, conventional loan. And how many Burrs have you done since 2019? So it's been, uh, I'm at 25 right now. That's uh, awesome. So, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, I was able to, so it's been what, three, three years now, mm -hmm. uh, almost four. So, uh, yeah, I'm at 25 units right now. That's amazing. Um, so you learned about real estate investing essentially through a LinkedIn ad. Am I reading it right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't just that. That was that was kind of like my, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like, oh, maybe you should look into this. Or, mm -hmm. And then, you know, from there, I started just on the internet, just watching YouTube videos, like reading articles on Bigger Pockets. Nice. Uh, joining Facebook groups, going to, you know, those investor meetups that I, that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I just kind of tried finding any, any possible source that could, that could give me information and, and just went from there. So investor meetups, those were here in Austin, which were those, uh, which meetups were those? I don't want to guess. Yeah. So it wasn't, um, so it was actually more specifically, it was another big wholesaler here in town. Mm -hmm selling you know they would sell i don't know like two or three houses per week mm. and they would have like these showings right to show yeah. potential investors yep. the house showings. itself yeah and i've been to and then and then there was like a like an auction right so like these investors would show up and bid on the property and you know i would just go and kind of like be a fly on the wall there and and just watch everything go down and you know, uh, eventually, you know, I would never bid on it, obviously, but eventually, like, you know, uh, after I I moved from San Antonio to Austin, uh, from an investing standpoint, um, I was eventually one of the guys bidding on the property. So that was that was a pretty cool moment. That's awesome. Yeah. So I think that everybody have, finds their way into real estate in a different way. But, you know, with the you you were linked in, and then just go into these. Essentially, the the wholesaler walkthroughs, property walkthroughs, what you were going to, um, but you started wholesaling in Austin too, right? So, how did you get started wholesaling in Austin? You talked about you were you were flipping contracts, is kind of how you referred to it. 
Um, you started wholesaling in Austin. How did you get started wholesaling? Was it just by watching this other wholesaler? And kind of go through the process of how you got started and, and where that business went. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I went through, you know, all these walkthroughs, the, all these showings that they were having with other investors. And I was like, I just started like asking questions, basically, you know, I'm not, I'm not really one that's scared to ask questions. I, I ask a lot of questions um, just when I, out of curiosity and out of wanting mm -hmm. to learn, right. Especially when it's, uh, something that I want to get into the business of doing. So I would ask, you know, not only there was two parties, right? There was the wholesaler and then investors. So I would ask the investors about, you know, how are they financing the deals? What are they going to do to add value to the house? What are they going to fix? Mm -hmm. you know, what contractor they're using, et cetera. And then on the wholesaling side, right? I would go to the wholesaler and ask them, you know, like how how much, you know, I would ask them, like naive questions, like how much did you get this under contract for? And like, how much are you going to, you know, expect to sell it for now? They wouldn't tell me like exact numbers or anything, sure. like that. Yeah. but um, they would kind of explain, you know, the, the process of like how they actually would do it. And, you know, I thought to myself, like, you know, is there any way I can do this? Right. I want to get into real estate, but I just don't have the money right now. And I see these people making a lot of money, you know, selling these to investors, they, they sell like two or three a week, they must be making a lot of money, right? So I just started asking the wholesaler how they did it and uh, watching YouTube videos again, on the internet. And yeah, basically just started trying it myself. And I would randomly started getting leads and, and started working those leads. And I uh, eventually was able to close my first deal. Um, it was actually like, maybe five minutes from rainy street which is like one of the most popular uh yeah streets here in austin and and i don't even want to look at what what that value what that uh, lot is worth nowadays but mm -hmm. yeah i was able to assign that one and then you know made a, a a decent amount of money pretty quickly and that was for sure the most amount of money i had ever made you know in like a such a short period of time and just from there i just was basically addicted to to doing it. So I just kept doing it and repeating what I, what I had learned. And that's what led me to have enough for the, for buying the first rental. Awesome. So yeah, you're just, you're learning as you go with the wholesaling deal. You, you, you learned some wholesaling from watching other wholesalers and then you went out and you were just finding the deals. Were you just door knocking, mailing people, that kind of stuff? Hey guys, this is Jordan Moorhead here. And I wanted to ask if you could do a huge favor for me if you could go leave a review for this podcast wherever you're listening to it, that would really help me get this into the hands of other people that are interested in information about Austin real estate investing, and I'd be able to help more people. Thanks, guys. Yeah, so most of it was pulling lists online. So there's like a lot of these websites that have a lot of data on um, just like mortgage information and like how much, you know, it's scary, the amount of information that's out there about like, yeah. you know, the equity that people have in their house and like, um, and you know, how long they've owned the property when the last time, you know, when the pro when was the last time the property was sold. And so you just basically kind of target, you know, certain areas and, and, uh, homeowners that have like very high equity in their house and, and just send them like either text messages or, or direct mails or, or you door knock and, uh, just try and find deals that way. Um, I don't do that anymore because it's a little just, uh, kind of aggressive, like marketing, uh, some people would say, but, um, you know, there's other ways that I, that I find uh, leads nowadays for, for wholesaling. I still do it every now and then, but I don't, I don't, uh, I've moved on to, you know, more mainly rentals. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. So can you tell our listeners just, you know, some mistakes to avoid with either burr or wholesaling? Like what's some of the biggest mistakes you've made or you've seen people make with, with a burr? Yeah, sure. A lot, actually, even a including lot. myself, right? So I made some of those mistakes as well. So oh, me too. Um, <laughs> so I would say uh, you make money when you buy is like mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, 
you know, quotes or that I, that I go by. And, and a lot of that comes with, you know, also doing your due diligence. So, um, those two things are like pretty big for sure. So a lot of the people that try and do this burr method, um, basically just buy the property at, at too high. Right. And they don't, mm-hmm. you basically need to buy, right. So it's, it's just a math formula, right. You will, you want to buy the property 75% minus repairs and that's what you want to buy it at so like let's say the house is worth you do your due diligence you're looking at a deal and you think it's worth let's say a hundred thousand to keep the numbers simple you want to buy it so 75 percent would be 75k and let's mm-hmm. say you need 25k in repairs mm-hmm. so you do the math and you would need to buy at fifty thousand, right you need to buy the property at fifty thousand in order for the burr method to work because you buy a 50, then you put in 25 into it. So you're all in at 75. And then you go to a conventional bank and you're like, hey, I have this property um, that I just fixed up, uh, whatever. I want to refinance it. It's currently into a hard money loan. I want to refinance it into a conventional loan that's that I can forget about and hold it for 30 years, right? Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, okay, we'll send out a, an appraiser and we'll loan you 75% of whatever value comes back, right? Now you already know, or you hope that it's going to come in, come back at a hundred, right? So mm-hmm. let's say it comes back at a hundred and you did like a perfect, <laughs> perfect due diligence. Um, then the bank would loan you 75,000, which is what you're all in for. And you basically just got, you know, a free house right, that you could hold on to forever. And the bank's like, here, we'll loan you 75,000, pay us back, whatever, $800 a month for the next 30 years. In your due diligence, you want to make sure that you know that, that it's going to appraise for 100,000 and that you can rent out the property for more than those $800 payments that I just mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to do a decent, a good amount of due diligence so that you're confident in your numbers, you know what it's going to appraise for, and you know what it can rent out for once you're done with it. So I'd say that's like, for sure, the biggest, uh, you know, kind of pitfall that a lot of people do is just not, you know, kind of doing, not doing enough due diligence, right? And, um, there's also another side of that, right? There's also too much due diligence, right? So mm-hmm. some people will get like in like analysis paralysis where they oh, just yeah. kind of, you know, just 20 deals, go through like hundreds of deals and just like analyze them way too much. And like, oh, what if, you know, I ran the numbers and I think it's going to appraise for a hundred thousand, which is what I needed to, to get all my money back. But, you know, there's this one comp or something or you know, interest rates are rising or X, Y, and Z, and they just kind of talk themselves out of it. So if you do your due diligence and the numbers work, you gotta, you gotta pull the trigger. So that that's, that's kind of what, what I would say. Yeah, no, don't get stuck in analysis paralysis, know your numbers. And when the numbers work, like you said, pull the trigger. You know, I know we've, I've had lots of situations where I've had the opportunity to buy a house and I've waited a day and it's gone. You know, if you see yeah. something and the numbers work, buy it right then. You, you'll have contingencies to figure it out at least in the next few days. So don't don't get too caught up in things being perfect before you take action. I think that's that's great advice right there. That's just enough advice. Just listen to that to get some deals done. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and just to touch on that, um, just to kind of show like how you know, kind of all in, I was on this and like confident in, in doing the numbers and like mm-hmm. if you're confident in the numbers. It, it should work out. So like most of these deals, like in San Antonio, I lived here in Austin when I was doing the deals in San Antonio and I just wouldn't have time to drive all the way over there and, and look yeah. at the property. So a lot of them I did sight unseen. So like these properties will get sold, like first come first serve within like you know, from going to all these showings, I would see like, you know, some of these would go in like an hour you yeah. know, after being sent out. So a lot of them, I would say maybe like I ever out of 10 properties, maybe like five, probably half of them where I would just buy them sight unseen. You know, I would run the numbers and make sure everything um, was, was in line and, and I would just pull the trigger. And, you know, if, if there was, um, 
you know, if, if, if the numbers didn't work, they didn't work, but at least I knew that I had done my due diligence and I had made sure that, you know, everything that I could control was, was in my favor. So. Love it. So, you know, I know a lot of people love the, the idea of burr. So, and why people love the idea of burr, in my opinion, and I've done some burrs and I do love burr because you can reuse the money. Everybody says, that sounds amazing. I want to reuse my money and buy more and more properties because that's the biggest, I have a friend that, that always says, you know, the biggest impediment to buying a property is saving up the next down payment. And that's where Burr really shines through because when you do it right, like you're saying, if you can be in at 75% ARV after repair costs, you can go do it again right away. Maybe you're doing a couple of those at a time. You can just keep them moving really quickly. That being said, uh, you got started on Burr after you'd done a bunch of wholesale deals and you understood some of the game. I didn't do a Burr until I had been investing in real estate for four years. Um, and, and everybody's got their own pace. I don't know why it took that long. But but <laughs> do you think that Burr is something that a brand new investor should do? So I get this question or I get people that are interested in Burr. Let's say you've never done a deal, you don't know real estate. Should I jump in and do a burr right away? Have you wanted to be part of GoBundance, the tribe of millionaires, but just haven't hit that millionaire status yet? Well, now you can, not even being a millionaire, by joining our new program, GoBundance Emerge. My name's Jamie Gruber, creator of GoBundance Emerge and member of the GoBundance community. And now you can join. GoBundance.com slash emerge. GoBundance.com slash emerge. Use code Jordan for $100 off this 12-week goal-setting program and mastermind that'll propel you to being a whole-life millionaire. So I'm... I'm biased for sure because sure. you know, I've seen a lot of success in the Burr method. So I would mm -hmm. say, yeah, actually, um, just because you know, what are your what are your other options? Your other options are, you know, if you want to, let's say you want to for sure buy a rental, right? So you you know you don't you're not going to flip it or sell it. Let's just say, like for example, first time uh, investor wants to buy a rental property, right? Mm -hmm. So your other option is is what just buying at market value right or uh buying below market value um and then just holding it and not refinancing mm -hmm. and the problem with that is you're not capturing equity right so the equity that's that you have in the house is is like literally in the house and locked you in the house it, right so like you said you know the biggest impediment to like real estate investors and the reason why like new investors get like kind of burnt out is running out of money right so mm -hmm. if you don't refinance the investment like quick quickly you're gonna take like you know either you know a year two years three years to save up enough for your next one right and you know in my opinion you're just not going to scale quick quickly and like you're just you know it's not going to be an attractive uh you know and you know game plan for yourself right you you mm -hmm. kind of want to build traction and start seeing the cash flow and the equity build up and getting your money back and moving on to the next one right so i, I think it's a great method for first time investors um I think it's even better than than like flipping. I think flipping is way too risky for first time investors. I mean, it it really is the same thing, right? So like invest let's say you do a flip, right? As your first one, you're also relying, you know, a big a big, you know, kind of hate or, or downside of the Burr method is that you're relying on an appraisal, right? The whole mm -hmm. thing basically relies on an appraisal. If you're flipping, it's the same exact thing. The whole thing relies on the appraisal as well, right? So, yeah, you know, if if you sell a house for two hundred thousand, but it appraises for one fifty, you have to, you know, change the price or come to terms with the seller, or I mean, with the buyer, and you know, it's a mess, right? So you're always going to be reliant on the appraisal, no matter what, no matter what strategy you pick. So I just don't see why why you wouldn't want to, you know, refinance and, and get your money back uh, immediately. Yeah, no, love the burst strategy. Um, so Nico, you've done, 
you've done quite a few burrs. You've done some in Austin. You've done some in San Antonio. You've done some wholesaling here in Austin. What's next for you? What are your long-term goals and what's your vision for the real estate career for you? Yeah, so um, long-term goals. I Right now, interest rates are, obviously everyone knows interest rates are rising. So mm-hmm. I've pivoted a little bit to um, back to lower purchase price uh, markets like Jacksonville, uh, St. Petersburg, and Tampa. Um, this allows me to protect myself from higher interest rates. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if higher interest rates shoot up, the loan amounts are so low since the purchase prices are low. So the monthly payments don't get affected as much versus if you're buying, you know, a Smart. half a million dollar property here in Austin and interest rates shoot up two points, three points, um, your payment's going to be going to be going to be a little crazy. So mm-hmm. even if, you know, not saying that no one should invest in Austin, I think, you know, Austin's one of the best real estate markets in the country, but I'm just saying, you know, be careful with, um, the interest rates that are, that are rising right now and, Mm -hmm. and and just pivot accordingly. Um, As for long-term goals, I want to start raising money and scaling by and buying more rentals uh, more, you know, more frequently. Right. So all of this uh, up to today, present day has been kind of bootstrapped by myself basically. So I haven't taken on any money from any investors or anything like that. So that's definitely, I think I've built a, a de- decent track record to be able to re- start raising money and syndicating for deals. Mm-hmm. And and that's kind of my long-term goal. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, scaling and, and continuing to buy single and, and multifamily and in uh in other markets is and with scaling with uh raising money is is my long-term goal. Love it. And I, I love that you you you're talking about bootstrapping in the beginning. Because now you can go to other people and say, hey, here's my track record. I paid for this or I did this. You know, so if you loan me your money, I know how to take care of my own money. I'm also going to take care of your money. And that's something I think a lot of investors want to do too early. They say they hear this OPM and I'm just going to borrow other people's money. And I'm like, yeah, go tell them (laughs) that you're going to take good care of their money when you've never done it. It's like, hey, gamble on me. I have no idea what's going on. But now for you, Nico, you're saying, hey, gamble on me. I've done this 25 times. I know this like the back of my hand. I've got the contractors. I've got the systems. I've got the formula. You know, give me your money. I'll give you a great return. So I love how you're doing it there. Um, Do you have a favorite business or mindset book that you like to recommend to people, Nico? Jordan Moorhead here. Really quick, he wanted to tell you a couple other ways you can keep track of us. If you want to listen to all these podcasts and ask questions, the Moorhead team on YouTube is the best place to be. And then Austin Real Estate Investors on Meetup is a great place to keep track of all of our meetups we have going on. So I know this one's completely overused and and probably everyone says it, but Rich Dad Poor Dad is Mm. is, uh, probably like the most, uh, I guess, basic, you know, puts it in the most basic terms, which is what I needed, right? And and you know, in high school and, you know, I learned of course in college, but in high school, which is when, when I read that book is like, I didn't really know, you know, I knew like a general term, like asset, right. And liabilities, but I didn't really know, like, uh, you know, in, in layman terms, like exactly what it was and like how it could be a good thing to, to have a lot of assets and, and, uh, yeah, that book just did an amazing job at like laying it out and and kind of explaining it to like a everyday person, right? So I, I would definitely recommend that book um, for for real estate investing if you want to get into it. Yeah, and I love that you know you talked about rich dad poor dad, then you talked about assets and liabilities, and really just understanding a balance sheet. And I want to say it talks about that in rich dad poor dad. It's either that or the cash flow quadrant. The, the subsequent follow-up book to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but understanding assets and liabilities and how you want to have much greater assets than liabilities is so helpful. And it seems like common sense to us now. You know, you and I, we've read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad books and we've read all these other books. And we've done some burrs, but just these basics, these brilliant basics are so important. So no matter where you're at in your career, I think 
reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, understanding how to read a balance sheet. That's all so important. I love that your favorite book because it's so important. It's so important. You can't get past that. You can't get past that until you master that. Yeah, completely agree. Absolutely. Nico, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you or follow you? Yeah, so I, I actually have a Instagram for, for the company. It's Storm Venture Partners. Uh, okay. So you can you can follow me on there. Um, that's where I post um, before and after videos. I post like financials on each deal. Oh. Um, you know, bef- everything from from A to Z on 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 all the deals that I do. So um, that's that's where everyone should find me. Is that all one word too? Uh, you know what? It's Storm. I can put it here in the chat. I mean, it's Storm Venture underscore. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll make sure to put this in the show notes for everybody too, but I just want to make sure that we get this right on the episode. So at Storm Venture Partners, and we'll get that out for you guys here in the, the show notes so you can make sure you follow Nico on Instagram and, and get all his content there. Uh, Nico, last question, most important question we have here on the Austin Real Estate Investing Podcast. What is your favorite restaurant in Austin? <laughs> Oh wow. Um favorite restaurant. I really like uh Leechas on East uh it's in East Austin. It's like a Tex Mex, like very authentic place. How do you um, spell that? I've not been there. It's uh I believe it's L I yeah, Leecha L I C H A S Leechas Cantina. Oh, actually, you know what? I may have been there. Awesome. Yeah, you should you should go there if you haven't. It's a great place. Um, very, very good food and drinks. And we'll get that in the show notes for everybody too. But, you know, I think with what we talked about here with Nico, it's so important to understand all your numbers with the Burr. Um, of course, you know, we talked about understanding a balance sheet and just really not letting the analysis paralysis overcome you. That's so important as a real estate investor because you can fix a lot of mistakes, but you can't make mistakes if you don't take any action. I really liked how you talked about that. And that gets in the way of so many people. There you go. Of course. Yeah, that that was, uh, you know, it's scary to to kind of just close your eyes and, and jump into a business like this. But if you really, you know, do your research and and do your numbers, as soon as the numbers work, you go for it. You don't, you don't look back. So that's kind of what I did and and what's led me to, to 25 units so far. So. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see what you do in the future. We're going to have to have you back on in a year or two, you know, as you're scaling up, but Nico, thank you so much for coming on here today. As always guys, I'm at Jordan underscore Moorhead on Instagram. We will have Nico's handle up here at storm venture partners on instagram too and that will be in the show notes for everybody to find for both of us thank you so much nico i'll talk to you here soon and have a great day thanks jordan 